any of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves. This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson. Hello, hello. Tommy, can you hear me? That's a reference to a 1960s band called The Who, in case you were wondering. Yes, I wasn't alive in the 1960s, but nevertheless, I wanted to reference it. It's Boomer Anderson here, your host of the Decoding Superhuman podcast. Superhumans, I'm so glad you're here with me today because my guest is an advisor, he's a mentor, and he's also a person who has, well, personally impacted my health in more ways than I can count. Dr. Daniel Stickler is the visionary pioneer behind human potential medicine. He's a physician to high-performing professionals as well as entrepreneurs who want to optimize their superhuman capabilities. Dr. Stickler is an expert in the use of genetics and epigenetics, and he also teaches clinicians as well as people like myself how to interpret that genomic data and utilize it to optimize your superhuman potential. Based on this data, Dr. Stickler develops personalized human potential optimization plans based on the individual blueprint of DNA, which I've talked about quite a bit, combined with the quality of life factors, as well as the seven foundational aspects of health, which compose a systems approach to health. His unique approach is highly effective and results in massive transformation. Oh, and by the way, Dr. Stickler on the side serves as the medical director for Neurohacker Collective, whose flagship product, Qualia, I've mentioned on the podcast with Peter Yostin, I've mentioned on the podcast with Monsal Denton, and is something that I still take every day. As you can imagine, we talk about a wide range of things here starting with what is human potential medicine? How do we use epigenetics as a systems approach to health? We get into plant sterols and plant sterols, for most people, they think of it as potentially a a great aspect to their health, but for certain percentage of the population can result in issues. We talk about what those genes are. We talk about the diet fit study recently released out of Stanford and whether or not a low fat or high fat diet is best for you. Finally, Dr. Stickler provides the tools, tech, and books he recommends to enhance performance. On the books, he threw me for a loop with this one, so I really look forward to hearing what you have to say about that. The show notes for this one are an absolute doozy and could be found at decodingsuperhuman.com backslash apiron. That's A-P-E-I-R-O-N. Before we get started, I want to bring back the sponsor. Because our guest today, Dr. Daniel Stickler, is the medical director of a company called Neurohacker Collective. Neurohacker Collective's flagship product, Qualia, is something that I use every day. Actually, five out of seven days, according to the directions that they give me. And I found that has reduced my supplementation costs so much, but also leaves me in this almost euphoric state of being. They have 40 premium brain ingredients in the product, and it immediately enhances my focus, energy, and mood, as well as my ability to think creatively and just manage my own anxiety and energy levels. The guys over at Neurohacker Collective have agreed to provide you as listeners a discount. That's 10% for using the code BOOMER, that's B-O-O-M-E-R, or 15% for subscriptions. When you look at the price tag of this, that's actually a pretty substantial amount of money. So go over and check it out at neurohacker.com. I like the product so much, I've invested a decent sum of my own money in the company. So I hope you enjoy it. And on with the podcast. Dr. Dan, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. I'm glad to be here. This is fun, fun stuff to talk about today. <laughs> you know, I, I, I owe so much to you and we'll get into that a little bit later, but I'm glad you can be here to talk a little bit about a few things. But first question I have for you is what is this human potential medicine that you practice? Do you mind explaining that to the audience? Yeah. And, and in fact, it's, it's worded that way. So people ask, what is that? <laughs> uh, because it really does require an explanation. Uh, I've been through a lot of training. I mean, I trained in allopathic medicine. I have done functional medicine. I've done alternative care, age management medicine. None of them really fulfilled my vision of what health and wellness kind of needed to be. And it was not what it was intended to be initially by the Greeks when they, when they formulated uh, medicine. And, and by the way, um, Hippocrates never said, let food be thy medicine. It was a, 
a marketing quote that was later later developed. Uh, it wasn't about medicine to them. And for me, what I have discovered over my time of being a physician, a surgeon, uh, doing alternative care, doing functional care, is that the whole system is based on an inaccurate premise of the human system. You know, we're treating a system based on a disease model. And it's not really the way the human system is intended. You know, we've, we've taken the, the complexity of the human system and tried to make it complicated, which really doesn't work when you're looking at wellness, health optimization, and really moving the body to a greater potential. And so what we decided to do was instead of trying to shift or change the paradigm, we needed to create a whole new paradigm. And we call it human potential medicine, but it's essentially like a, a systems-based uh, precision approach to health optimization. And it's all about really getting the body to homeostasis. And once there, then expanding it up to greater levels. And we do that through this systems-based approach using genetics, epigenetics, uh, as well as environmental interactions and looking at all the systems of the human body at one time, not really focusing on a disease care model or, or fixing a broken problem. Okay, so a couple of things that come out of that. Uh, why, why epigenetics as the center? Uh, and of course, we use epigenetics in our practice, but I want to hear your answer here. And also, what can't epigenetics do for you? Uh, well, to answer the second part first, I can't think of anything that we can't do with epigenetics. And that's the great thing about it. You know, we, we've come through this era of genetics now, you know, we mapped the human genome and we thought, you know, this is, this is the new era, but we took it too far, uh, as far as the absolutes of it. So we looked at the genetic code and we were saying, well, you carry this code. That means this, you have an MTHFR mutation. That means you need to take this supplement. Well, what we discovered over time, and some people are still stuck in that model, but what we've discovered is that really the epigenetics is the key. And that's the, the ability to change the expression of that hard code. So, you know, the, the genetics themselves are essentially the hardware of the computer, whereas the epigenetics is the software that's loaded onto it. So we have this ability to to change expressions through lifestyle patterns, through supplementation, through medications that can alter expressions of those hard-coded genes. And that's the beauty of the control that we have over this. Uh, a lot of people will take epigenetics and they'll take it into kind of a, a woo-woo world to explain things that are unexplainable. But we've taken a more scientific approach with it and looking at what is the science about, you know, how does this supplement create this outcome. You know, just as something as simple as exercise. We all know exercise works to make us healthier. Have, we, have you ever asked why it works though? Most people don't. Uh, meditation, we know it works, but why? And epigenetics has actually been able to show us the answers to that. We, we see the changes in expressions of over 7,000 genes when we exercise chronically. I mean, that's a third of our, our genes and how they're expressed in the body. There's upregulation, there's downregulation, there's turning genes on, turning genes off, all because of exercise, all because of meditation. And the research is out there. I mean, there's over 10,000 peer-reviewed scientific articles a year in epigenetics and telling us this stuff. You know, we know if we eat a meal of omega-3s, we change expression of several hundred genes. We eat omega-3s as a part of the diet for three to six months on a regular basis, we change expressions of thousands of genes from that. So now we're understanding why lifestyle is so impactful and where we, we truly have an explanation rather than saying, well, it works, but now we know why it works. And that's, that is the beauty of epigenetics. Excellent. So one, if we don't mind just going down a little bit into some of the, the items that I cover with clients that I know you cover with clients. One area that is particularly of interest for people and a little bit shocking is plant sterols. Uh -huh. Do you mind walking through just what a plant sterol is and why for some people this is actually a potential issue and something that they need to address? You know, we look at things as healthy or unhealthy, but not really paying attention to the mechanisms of how they work a lot of the time. 
And plant sterols, I mean, we, we've all heard how healthy plant sterols are for us. They, they help lower cholesterol. Uh, they help detoxify the body. Those are really huge outcomes, but that's a phenotypic expression. That's the long, that's the end road of the outcome. But how do those work? And one of the mechanisms is their toxins. They are low grade toxins. It puts a stress on the body. We get upregulation of the detoxifying enzymes in the body. So actually genetic expression gets upregulated in the, the genes that express enzymes for detoxification. And so we have a better body ability to detoxify variety of things, uh, but it was in, induced by this toxin. I mean, a tomato has 40 known toxins to the human body in it, but plant sterols themselves, they work really well for like cholesterol because they mimic cholesterol. Plant sterol is the fat of plants. It's very similar in structure, but not identical to the cholesterol that we produce or that we consume in animal fats. And the gut uh, the receptors in the gut that they, they grab hold of those and absorb them, they don't differentiate whether it's a plant sterile or a cholesterol molecule. So they pull it into the cells that line the gut. But we have a nice, uh, beautiful mechanism built into those cells with a gene. There's actually two genes, the ABCG8 and the ABCG5, that will recognize those plant sterols as abnormal. And they'll grab a hold of them and kick them back out before they can absorb into the bloodstream. But what it's doing is it's minimizing the absorption of fats and cholesterol because there's competition between the plant sterols and, and what we consume. So it's great from that standpoint. But it's reported that about seven to eight percent of the population carry this. Now, as you know, we've seen a much higher rate of that in our clients, uh, upwards of around 15% of people carrying this ABCG8 variant. And sure enough, when we run blood plant sterile levels, we see elevated levels when we see that. It's fairly common in that group. So if they carry that variant, um, they're absorbing too much plant sterols. And you say, well, why is that a bad thing? Well, it's because once it gets into the system, and we've already spoken about the fact that cholesterol and plant sterols are very similar in structure, and the body has a little difficult time recognizing which is which. So in those processes that the body utilizes cholesterol, it may grab a hold of a plant sterile like cytosterol and incorporate that into the lipoprotein or the hormone or something like that, that changes the function of it. It alters the function in a very negative way. Usually it makes it non-functional, but the body then recognizes that as a foreign material, especially like in in LDL particles, if it sees it in an LDL particle, the macrophages say, whoa, this is something, there's something wrong with this LDL particle. So it grabs hold of it and puts it in the wall of the vessel. We kind of comically refer to this as the anti-vegetarian gene, because if you carry it, you've got to minimize your exposure to plant sterols or your consumption of plant sterols, because it does translate into people having heart disease at an early age. It's highly toxic when you absorb a lot of these cytosterols into the blood and it does create plaques um, at a very young age in the 30s and 40s. So it, it's an important gene to really understand if you have a variant of and if you do then you get tested for uh, blood cytosterol levels. Okay and based on that test and let's say you come back and you say <clears throat> have a higher level of beta cytosterol or whatever cytosterol level what can you do? Because you can avoid, <laughs> there's only so many plant sterols that you can avoid. Uh, you know, avoiding them completely is not exactly an option. Well, and that's, that is the crux of the, of the situation. I mean, we, we're dealing with some of the best foods that we consume, even from an epigenetic standpoint, to contain sterols, um, especially cytosterol. Uh, when we're looking at olive oil, avocados, um, blueberries, I mean, these are like hugely beneficial foods. Talk, you're talking about every superfood list there is. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, and it's hard because the studies are not indicating that limiting those, those sterile intakes really lowers that cytosterol level dramatically. And that's, that's where we kind of run into a bit of a problem. In those situations, we, we've typically found that medication actually works well. And I'm not talking about like statin drugs. I'm not a big fan of statins at all. Um, but you can use absorption blockers that will actually bind the cytosterol in the intestine. Drugs like Zetia or 
cholestyramines that, that actually don't absorb. They don't have an impact inside the system because they're not absorbing. They just kind of bind up those cytosterols in the, in the intestines so that we don't absorb them. And that seems to work really well. And then you can continue getting the beneficial effects of consuming the, the high cytosterol foods that, that provide other benefits. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. that that's great. I want to just hop over to another topic and because I have you on and it's a relatively recent topic in terms of both genetics, but recent scientific studies released. And I know diets and I hate the word diet, but also nutrition plans are of focus for people. A lot of people listening, maybe on ketogenic diet, paleo diet, et cetera. But can you talk about the Stanford research study that just recently came out? That's the diet fit study. And, um, Interesting. One of our uh, one of our instructors on our team is uh, Dr. Aronica, who is a a researcher and uh, and she teaches epigenetics at Stanford. But she's a researcher in in that particular lab that produced the the results. And uh, there's a lot of problems with that study. And I, I you know I almost feel like the study was sensationalized a little bit too much because it basically said it doesn't matter if you're low fat or high fat in the diet that weight loss is is identical one that kind of conclusion based on the data was was really not an ideal conclusion based on what i understand of the data and what i've read of the study they had people on on high fat diet or a low fat diet and and the difference was pretty minimal i mean the the low fat dieters were taking still you know, around 50 grams of fat, whereas the high fat dieters were taking 90 to 100 grams. So you're really talking about a 350, 400 calorie difference. Now, they also looked at carbohydrate consumption and even the, the high fat consumers were consuming pretty substantial levels of carbohydrates. I mean, it certainly was not a, a low carb diet per se. And the low carb, I think they were consuming right around 100 grams or 100 yeah, 100 grams of carbohydrates, whereas the low fat group was consuming around 200 grams. So you're, again, you're talking about 350 calorie difference. And what they found is that both groups ended up consuming roughly the same amount of calories on average. So around 1500 calories, which is a calorie restricted diet. So of course, if they're if the average consumption of the total calories is the same, you know, in this short term study, you're going to see pretty identical weight loss, which is exactly what they saw. So they concluded that it doesn't matter whether it's a high fat or a low fat diet. And that's not a legitimate conclusion, in my opinion. Now, Dr. Aronica is actually going to be looking at epigenetic expressions in those groups, which is going to be really cool when we see what actually happens with the gene expressions in that group, because that's going to predict the long-term benefits or, or uh, detriments of that particular macronutrient mix in a diet, even though they're pretty close. I think you're still going to see some differences in that. Uh, the other thing they did is they looked at the genetics. And there's been a lot of uh, studies. In fact, a study that came out of that particular lab that, or was associated with a study that came out of that lab, that lab did the, uh, Dr. Gardner's lab did the A to Z study, which looked at Adkins versus Zone versus, um, I forget what the other diets were in that, but there were several of them. And they reported that the high fat diet was best for weight loss. This is the one that had the Ornish diet in it as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, correct. I, I remember um, that. But one of the problems that they, they found with that study was that Nobody followed the diet regimen exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, adherence is pretty. And low, so right? it wasn't really a good study. Uh, and and all dietary studies are like that. I mean, unless you have somebody like locked into a facility for the duration of the study, you can't really understand fully what their macronutrient mixes are. You know, even if you try to recall your diet, you just don't do well with with that. It's just it's hard to to really assess the accuracy of macronutrient mixes. But then the interleukin uh, was a company that did a genetic analysis of those people on those diets and they matched the genetics to the dietary patterns. And they found that people who did best on the high fat diet carried certain genes, whereas the ones that did best on the low fat diet carried certain genes. So it became a genetic study. Well, Diet Fits decided to look at some of those genes in this piece, but they looked at three genetic polymorphisms. And those are three base pairs out of three billion base pairs in the human genome. Granted, there's only 10 million genetic polymorphisms in the, in the whole human genome, but they're looking at three. Number one, it was a small study. Two, they're looking at three genes 
I can't understand why they they even reported conclusions based on that. But all the general public sees is the headline. Uh, fit gene study says, you know, there's no difference between a high fat and a low fat diet. Diet fit study says that there is no way to use genetics to predict diet. Okay. And then it gets passed down to men's health and men's health says there's nothing you can do about yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, those are just stretches uh, of people that want to sensationalize it without understanding exactly what it's doing. And, the, and you know, that's where we stand at appear on is we want to be authorities in, in presenting what's real and what's not what makes sense and what doesn't. It's no longer about sensationalism. I mean, people want true science and understanding. What, is it, what does it really mean? I mean, how does that translate? And we're all genetically individual and we need to adjust our lifestyle to match that genetics. I mean, you can hear all these high fat promoters are like, well, you know, you look at the, the Eskimos and you look at the tribes in Africa and they consume... 80% of their calories is fat and they have no problems with heart disease and anything. You know what? They have a very specific genetic variant ancestrally that gives them benefit for doing that. You know, we look at like MTHFR. I mean, MTHFR is a variant that, that occurred in ancestrally in people that had high access to folates. And it's not a mutation. It's not nowhere close to a mutation. I mean, right now, 25% of the population carries the, the variant. Uh, you have to have less than 1% for it to be a mutation. So if anybody tells you you have an MTHFR mutation, run, because they have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> but there are specific benefits to having that variant of MTHFR. When you're in a folate-rich environment, you actually have greater survival of a fetus that carries that. You have lower risks of colon cancer as you get older, as long as you maintain a fully rich diet. So you just adjust your lifestyle to fit that ancestral kind of genotypes that you carry because those genotypes were developed as a uh, thriving mechanism in that environment that you were in. And now we've moved all around the world. So all of our ancestry is, is scattered and we're no longer living in those environments that our genes have adapted to thrive in. And we haven't quite adapted yet to these new environments. And with the environment constantly changing, it's important to really look at those genetics and understand what has the highest probability of giving us the, the best ability to thrive. One last question before I get into basically the final three questions that I ask everyone. Because you're so into the field of genetics and you're kind of hands-on and right at the forefront there, what do you think of CRISPR and the implications of CRISPR? Uh, <laughs> I, I realize this is a pretty common question that you must get, but do you think designer babies are around the corner? Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a hornet's nest, Boomer. Uh, <laughs> I personally am a transhumanist. I think that... Do, do you mind defining transhumanism for some of the people that don't know? Yeah, I mean, transhumanism looks at, you know, we, we have this, this naive concept that, that Homo sapien is the end point of evolution and that it's the ultimate goal of creation, you know, that we've achieved it, it's done. And, and it's naive to think that. I mean, we're constantly adapting and changing with, with environmental pressures. Uh, in fact, I believe our genes are programmed to make us die over time. I mean, we have biologic organisms have the ability to regenerate everything and yet we die. Why do we die? Because we need to be able to procreate and provide adaptation pressures. Um, people call it the red queen hypothesis, but it's, it's about being programmed to die so that we don't get stuck with a certain genetic expression that isn't going to thrive in a changing environment. Um, but transhumanism looks at the human state and says, you know, what is the next step in human evolution. And a lot of the transhumanists believe that it's somehow the merging of the, the biologic system with technology. And, and I'm a firm believer in that. And that technology can be CRISPR, it can be nanotechnology, it can be implants. I um, mean, we already have transhumanists out there, you know, the, the people with cochlear implants, the people with uh, artificial limbs, people with hip implants. I mean, that's transhumanism. But um, people look at it in a very negative light, or some people do. Elon's invest, Elon Musk, that is, uh, he's invested quite a bit into kind of making this possible, right? His belief is, is that, you know, we need to 
be able to outrun AI, and so therefore we must become AI. Is well, that right? that's that's the thing. I mean, futurists see that, and futurists understand that every organism has either gone extinct or adapted, and so every organism that has ever existed has had to go through that. Uh, we're no different. So do we go extinct or do we adapt? And AI technology and and merging of technology with, with the human system, I think is that thing that will, will help us to achieve that. Now, CRISPR is, is very interesting. I mean, it's very young right now, but it's showing great promise in editing the genome. You know, I think designer babies is um, not quite what we're looking at at this stage. Yeah, that could be a future of it. I mean, I see artificial wombs. I mean, women not carrying children anymore. And then, you know, optimizing the genetic expressions. I mean, you're still going to have children with the best genes from each of the parents, which is great. And, you know, optimizing certain genes. So procreation is still going to occur. But, uh, you know, CRISPR has the great ability to enhance the human state. I mean, people are, are using it for insertion of genes that help to retain muscle mass as we get older. Uh, they're looking at insertions of genes that add length to our telomeres so that we can live a longer, healthier life. You know, there's there's great things with it. It's just right now, it's such a new technology that there's a lot of um, uncertainty as to what it's actually doing. But I do feel like, um, you know, as things progress, it's going to be much more common in the near future. So many questions come out of everything you just <laughs> said. But in the in the interest of time, I want to I want to move into. Uh, the final three questions, which I ask everyone. What is the top tool or technology that are you yourself are currently using to become more superhuman? I've seen some uh, of them, but I'm kind of yeah, curious. Yeah, that's an easy one. It's the, uh, the, my new toy, which is the uh, uh, Phoenix 5 uh, X from Garmin. You know, I have played with wearable technology. I'm, I've done consulting work with Google on wearable technology and health. And... Um, there's a lot of them out there that I've tried. Um, I keep upgrading to new ones, but this this Phoenix Five is probably the the one that I. Uh, it's as good as sex. Uh, it really <laughs> is. This this stuff. This tells me so much data on myself. I mean, skin temperature, heart rate variabilities. I mean, it looks at my running cadence. It looks at my my time of contact on the ground with my runs. It, calculates a VO2 max based on a bunch of different uh, biometric parameters. It shows me, you know, one thing it showed me was my temperature drops during my workouts if I don't take nitric oxide uh, precursors like, uh, like beet elite, which is the beet crystals. Uh, when I take that, my temperature doesn't drop during the workouts. So that feedback is always there. If I have a glass of wine one evening, the, I look at my sleep during that night and my sleep's disrupted. This is the way that you can get feedback on your body. You know, we have we have this this concept that we we try to justify things that are healthy, or if we enjoy them, we justify them as healthy. And it may not necessarily be the case. Without biometric monitoring, we don't have that objective. All we have to rely on is, yeah, I feel better, or I I look better, or whatever it is. But with biometric technology, I can see. You know, I'm I I did some intense workouts early in the week. And my HRV and stress level actually stayed high, uh, wasn't even getting rest during sleep. So I knew I had to take a couple of days off in order to get my, my HRV back into a healthy range. And now today I'm going to go back into the gym because now I, I know my body's fully recovered from those intense workouts. So I think biometric monitoring is absolutely essential as part of a technology and and it, i mean i guess it's kind of transhumanism it's wearable technology it's not implantable <laughs> but if i can measure it i can change it and i can mitigate it that's that's my my mantra what what gets measured gets managed right and exactly okay next question and you may be a little bit biased on this one given your background but what's the <laughs> top piece of advice you would give for people who are looking to increase cognition it could be a tool or technology or even supplement yeah, so what you're referring to is the fact that I'm the medical director for Neurohacker Collective, <laughs> I, I assume. Uh, you know, brain technology enhancements are, are tough because the brain has this it's built-in mechanism that if you enhance one area, it draws away from another. 
Um, we saw this with the DARPA studies on the, on the snipers accelerating their learning curve by using uh, trans, transcranial uh, direct current stimulation, where they accelerated the learning curve dramatically. Um, but then what they discovered was that the automaticity of that learning dropped off dramatically. So you're sacrificing whenever you selectively enhance areas. So I'm always big about building the whole homeostasis of the brain, taking it to a level where it's in idle and can shift gears in into high or low split, with a split second. You know, just the cognitive ninja, I call it, so that you can you can do that. Uh, I do like the quality of product because of that. Um, that's what attracted me to them in the first place. And um, had been using it, and they they reached out to me to be their medical director, and so it wasn't uh, it wasn't that I became medical director and then suddenly sold on the product. We've also done a lot of studies on it. Overall, I think people go down the wrong road with looking at specific cognitive enhancement. I mean, I've done stuff with with modafinil and and other prescription enhancers, and there's always a downside to them, and they don't necessarily optimize across the board. So really good meditation practices, good sleep practices, good nutrition, uh, good supplementation practices. Those are the things that enhance cognitive function. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, you're going back to the systems approach, right? And exactly. I mean, the whole system. yeah. When you start focusing on one piece, you, you've kind of lost the, the battle there. Last question, best book. And I know you're a big reader like me, best yeah. book you've read on peak performance. On peak performance, you know, I'm going to take that away from you because uh, there's so many good books on peak performance. Um, you can peak, rattle off many. <laughs> yeah, peak is peak is a really good one, a recent one that I've uh, that I've looked at uh, that I've read. But I have to, you know, I have to say my favorite book of all time is Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. I don't know if you have read that before. I, I haven't. So you've just it caused my Amazon account to ring up another book today. <laughs> yeah, Ishmael is a it's a conversation with a gorilla. If that piques your interest, any uh, it does, and it brings a lot of questions. So what what about the book was so appealing to you? It really had me look at health and society from a whole different perspective. Uh, it was very instrumental in my movement into the field that I'm in right now. You will find that I use a lot of the metaphors that are in that book. You've probably heard me say them in some of my teachings, but it is a profoundly impactful book. Uh, I read it, geez, back in 2004, and, and it really changed my life from that point forward, uh, the direction that I was going in. After this, I'm going to go on Amazon and buy it. So thank you. Thank you. For that it's a one. good book to listen to, too, and audio. It's really well done on audiobook. Okay. So Audible it is. Now, where can people find out more about you, Dr. Dan? Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you can go to uh, peeroncenter.com. That's spelled A-P-E-I-R-O-N center.com. Uh, if you fill out the contact form there, it comes right to my email. If you're looking to learn to be an epigenetic coach like you are, Boomer, then you can go to Academy and learn more about uh, the way we teach and uh, and what we offer for, for coaching. We'll put this all in the show notes, which is going to be found at decodingsuperhuman.com backslash Apiron. That's A-P-E-I-R-O-N. And... You know, Dr. Dan, I think last thing is I, I owe you a huge thank you. And it all came because I was having coffee at the place right across from the Apiron Center in Asheville. <laughs> and you've sent me down an awesome road, not only in terms of fixing my own health, but also helping individuals. Now we're in, I think, five countries as of today. So helping individuals yeah. all across the, the world in terms of using genetics and epigenetics to better their health and performance. So huge thank you to you as both advisor and, uh, and instructor as well as teacher. So thank you again. Uh, my Amazon account continues to pump up because of the books you recommend. So I really appreciate everything you do. Awesome. Well, I appreciate uh, what you're doing and uh, helping to, to spread the new paradigm. That's, uh, that was our mission and, uh, you know, we love having people as passionate as you uh, helping to be a part of that. Excellent. Well, thank you again, Dr. Dan, and thank you to all the superhumans who are listening to this podcast.
Superhumans, before you go, can I ask you one favor? If you enjoyed this podcast, if you really got a lot out of it, can you do me a favor? Go over to iTunes right now. Just drop a little five-star review there with a couple of comments, maybe some potential topics you'd actually want to hear about. Or you can drop me an email over at podcast at decodingsuperhuman.com. I'd love to hear about what guests you want to hear from, what topics you want to hear about, and things you would like us to cover in this podcast. Because after all, it is for you and it's meant to make your lives better so that you could be higher performers and really change the world. I hope you have an epic day and thank you again for listening. How many of us ever know what it is to become the perfect version of ourselves? This is Decoding Superhuman with your host, Boomer Anderson.